So guys, today we will be talking about the very important topic that is roaming in Wi-Fi networks. If you don't know what the roaming is, you're probably not alone. We'll be talking about how it differs from initial association, how to improve it, how to fix it, how to optimize your existing networks to make sure that roaming is absolutely spotless, how to design your networks for spotless roaming, what can affect it, what can break it, and so on and so forth. So stay tuned for that. Let's do a quick round of introductions. We have a massive star of the show today. Scott McDermott has joined us. Scott, hello, my friend. How are you doing and where are you joining us from? Uh, I'm doing great. I, I, and I am from Michigan, northern from part Michigan. of Michigan. Yep. Okay, chaps, if you don't located. know Scott. Sorry? I, say, I said, if you don't know Scott, then you will know him very well after today's webinar. Scott is our ECEC instructor as well and a legend in the Wi-Fi industry. So if you have not followed Scott yet on Twitter or on LinkedIn, please do so. It's worth it. So Scott, thank you very much for joining. And Absolutely. Chaps, thank you, Dale. It's amazing to have you on. Welcome, welcome everyone. And I'm Mark. Uh, I'm a director of ECSE University and Product Marketing, and I'm joined by Stu and Dale, our amazing sales engineers from Americas. You all right, guys? Going good today. Thanks. Amazing. Okie doke. So let's crack on. Let's start first with what is roaming. So roaming, guys, is where you start jumping from radio to radio, from BSSID to BSSID. BSSID is a MAC address of a radio, and roaming is very similar to the initial association. So when you first connect, your when your device first connects to the Wi-Fi network, it goes through everything. So depending on the security of the Wi-Fi network, it can be very fast, like, you know, open, open, or it can be a little bit slower and more complicated where we have four ways handshake like PSK or SAE. And it can be quite complex. When you have a radio server in the backend, then it's very, very complex. So initial association is always the longest. And then if you don't do anything else to your configuration, a roaming event, when your device jumps between APs, is also as long as the initial association. So roaming is also called the re-association, and it's pretty much the same. And a quick tip here, you can improve the time that it takes for your devices to roam, and we will be talking all about that. Okay, so let's quickly talk about why roaming is important. So Scott, do you think we need to have a good roaming for this guy? For a stationary phone, no, it's not moving. Roaming is not really important for it because it's just going to connect to a radio and hang on to it. Yeah, exactly. So when you have a cable hanging out of a device, it's not a problem. How about this one, my friend? That is an entirely different story because now we've got people, you know, talking on the phone, walking down the hallway, moving from one end of the building to the other while they're in the middle of a conversation or teams or maybe they're watching a webinar. Who knows what it is, you know? <laughs> exactly. So guys, it's very important to understand that long time ago, we were talking a lot about voice over Wi-Fi. Like, you know, you had the VoIP phones and stuff, and now you probably don't have these VoIP phones anymore because you have soft phones running on your mobile devices. And pretty much in every environment that you go to, if it's an office or a industrial plant or a warehouse or a super boat or whatever it might be, you will have people with their phones walking around and relying on fast roaming on, you know, fast transition between APs, between the radios, between BSSIDs. So be mindful of that. This typically what we see on the screen is what we call LCMI, least important, most, uh, well, most important, least capable device. <laughs> and when we are designing the network or configuring the network, we want to make sure that this guy, like, you know, the phone is jumping between the APs fast. Okay, so let's talk about the importance of roaming in Wi-Fi networks. So I will cover the first one, then you Scott cover the second one, and then we'll alternate. So first, uh, modern applications are time sensitive. Voice calls, uh, the conferences, Anything like that is time sensitive. If you have slow roaming, so when you're connected to one AP, then you're moving farther away from it and you are connecting to another AP because you have to, to maintain the signal that is enough for modulation to be able to, you know, get the ones and zeros into the air, understand what's happening and get the frames into the air. Then if it's slow, then your conversation is over. Okay. Your voice call drops, your video gets choppy, then your 
conference call or a webinar drops as well. Okay, number two, Scott. So in a wireless first scenario, the idea here is we're we're not we're trying to avoid running wires everywhere. So we're doing wireless for everything. And so if our if our goal is to have everything wireless first, people are going to be using all of their devices. So even if you don't have you know, bring your own device setups or, you know, people bringing in their phones or, you know, maybe you actually are using uh, some sort of tablet or I made the logo upside down tablet or mobile device. You know, if you're in a retail environment, they may be using those for uh, for like, you know, point of sale services and people are going to be walking around and they're not going to be connected all the time. And so every time they walk from one part of the building to another, they get they moving away from the AP. They're going to have to move to some other AP to continue to pr provide that service. And it's just, if you're wireless first, it's like somebody picks up their laptop and they head to the office. I mean, they might even continue to stay connected with how well that's going to work is going to depend on the laptop, but that's another part of our discussion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Scott, before we continue, we have a question from the audience. How are your alpacas doing? <laughs> the alpacas are doing well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the so llamas too. And <laughs> yeah, uh, number three, slow roaming will be perceived as dodgy by Wi-Fi users. So especially in the Wi-Fi first environment, but not only if you have slow roaming, even though your Wi-Fi is the latest and greatest, you have, you know, six gigahertz tri-band radios in your massive expensive access points and it's well configured and everything is beautiful. And you have like, I don't know, nine giga gigabits per second, you know, uh, throughput on the box on your access point. That's what it says. When you have slow roaming, it doesn't matter, right? Because when you're jumping from the APs, your connectivity is gone and your users will see your posh, amazing Wi-Fi as a slow Wi-Fi. And they will just laugh at you as a, you know, owner of such networks. So be careful with roaming, very important. Number four, Scott. So in the case of a of slow roam, we also can potentially have the issue of devices getting off of the network because they are taking too long to get connected to the next, uh, to the next AP. And even if they're not, even if they don't, technically get completely disconnected from the user's perspective, it's going to be the same thing, right? So a, a lot of the things that happen in Wi-Fi, it's like, it's it's all about the user's perspective because, you know, the user's like, hey, Wi-Fi is slow. It's like, well, what does that mean? Well, it depends on the perspective of the user. What's causing that is an entirely separate thing. So a lot of these things are about user perspective. But if I'm walking down the hall and I'm connected and I'm talking to somebody on the phone and I have a slow roam, as far as I'm concerned, I just got disconnected. It doesn't matter whether or not the device actually disconnected because it's like, you're gonna feel like your call ended. If it takes too long to roam and it's easy to have roams that take too long, your call is gonna drop anyway. So you're like, hey, you know, am I even connected to the Wi-Fi anymore? And you may technically not be, but you'll get connected again. But it's like, if somebody had a computer and you like rip the cable out of the back of the computer, they lose all their connections. Slow, a, a slow enough roam will cause that kind of effect. And then the user loses everything that they've been trying to do. Exactly. And when you're dropping off from the network, like completely, sometimes your device will go into like, you know, a panic scan mode where it's not, it's no longer connected to the Wi-Fi network. And now it starts going, you know, from channel to channel to either listen to beacons or probe, depending if channels are DFS or non-DFS. On non-DFS channels, your device can probe very quickly, saying like, hello, anyone out there? And then it will have a response from all the access points on the particular channel. But on DFS channels, and we have 16 DFS channels on five gigahertz band, you can't probe, okay? You have to wait for a beacon. So every time you go to a channel to discover a channel, to discover a BSSID, a radio on that channel, it takes forever. By forever, I mean like, you know, 120 milliseconds at least to dwell on every single channel and time that by 20 channels or 25 channels or add six gigahertz to it. And you're talking, if you're unlucky, you're talking seconds here. So device is dropping off from the network. It will affect your business. If you have a mobile environment where people are moving around the office and they are on the voice calls and they rely on these voice calls to make you money, if they're dropping off, this money is gone. Okay. So yeah, it's bad. So number six, what's that? It, anytime anything really changes in the environment, you might need to have make adjustments. Now, it could be requirements changed because you got a new application or maybe you're getting new devices. I mean, if you go from you know one model of PC to another model of PC with a newer network card, you if you know in your wireless first office, if we were designing for the for laptops, 
you might need to adjust your requirements. Or if you're going from, you know, uh, I had a customer who had a warehouse and their whole network was designed around these handheld scanners, but then they changed the way they were doing things in the warehouse so that now they had uh, PCs or tablets actually, but their tablets permanently mounted in all of the fork trucks and they had their own radios and they're doing RFID scanning for the, uh, uh, for the uh, material, the product that they're moving around in the building and whatnot. But then we've just radically changed our mobile platforms to something that's basically a laptop with a touch screen from something that was maybe a little bit somewhat more purposely designed to be mobile. So our requirements just changed because the devices have different sensitivities, et cetera. And if your environment changes, it's, you know, a new, another company moves in next door and they deploy a whole ton of wireless. Well, you know what, now you're, now you're having issues where uh, you're having to share the channels. And so now you're having to look at optimization just to avoid various forms of interference, or maybe if there's enough traffic on their network, it's going to make it harder for your devices to roam because it's going to be harder for them to find your APs and talk to your APs if the channels that they're trying to use are already really busy with someone else's access points and their tra and their devices for that matter. Yeah, exactly. And also guys like try to imagine scenarios I was in this situation when I was talking with my with my clients, with my friends, uh, not too long ago. They had used just nine channels and five gigahertz in a massive warehouse environment. The CCI, the same channel interference, cross channel interference was through the roof, and they've decided to just use nine channels instead of twenty five because of their old barcode scanners. They didn't support. DFS channels, so they just supported first four and last five channels of all the available channels and five gigahertz band. And then they moved away from these devices, but the channels configuration, it stayed. So now they are running the latest and greatest Zebras that they support everything. And they are like two by two, like kind of a mid-range Android devices with scanning capabilities. So very good Wi-Fi clients. And they were still running nine channels. So be mindful of that, guys. Adapt to the changes and optimize your environment every now and then. Okay. Next one. So how does roaming work so roaming works in three stages it's a little bit of an oversimplification but for for the sake of understanding the basics of roaming association we need to be mindful of three stages stage number one is the wi-fi discovery okay and wi-fi discovery is your device before it associates to the network initially or before it jumps to another access point when it's moving farther away from its initial association it will have to to, to, to understand which radios it will be good for the device to roam to, okay? And in order to know that, it has to discover these APs, discover these radios. And we will be talking about discovery mechanisms in a second, and it will be different for 2.4 and 5 legacy bands, and it's totally different on 6 gigahertz band. We'll talk about that in a second. And the second category, second thing that is very important for, for roaming association is the association decision. So now your device has found 10 APs, okay, 10 radios that are good enough from a device's perspective. Which AP does the device connect to? Which AP, which radio, which BSSAD does the device associate with, okay? And it's always, or almost always, or most of the times, it's device's decision. It's my phone's decision. It's my laptop's decision. And the decision-making process is called the green diamond. And we'll be talking about that in a second as well. And then number three is the association or re-association. Association, initial one, re-association, roaming, pretty much the same thing, if no other things are configured in your network. So the association or re-association, it will include the open system authentication and association, and then possibly other security things, depending on what we're using. If it's open, open, there is nothing else. If it's PSK, then we have four-way handshake. If it's SAE, that's some Diffie-Hellman stuff in the background. If it's .1x, then we'll, depending on, you know, EAP type, if it's EPTLS or EPEEP or whatever else, it will be sl slightly different, but it can be quite complicated, okay? So we'll be talking about the connection, the association process as well. All righty, so let's talk about the first one, Wi-Fi discovery. So, Scott, why won't you talk us through the sure. discovery in legacy bands? So in our legacy bands, that's 2.4 and the five gigahertz, which five gigahertz may not feel like legacy, but it's kind of, um, but we have two main methods of actually discovering. So our clients can send a probe 
which is asking for, they, they can send either a wildcard probe, which asks whatever APs are on the channel to tell them about every SSID on the channel, or they can send a directed uh, or a directed probe. I don't think that's the right word, but anyway, they, they can send a probe where they ask for a very specific SSID because usually, and when we're going to be roaming, that's what clients will be doing because they're already connected to a network. So they'll be looking around in other channels, trying to find the SSID that they're currently connected to. And they're going to be asking the APs on that channel. Hey, do you serve this SSID? Or actually I should say on this channel, does anybody serve this SSID? And they very quickly can get a response. So active uh, discovery is great because act in active discovery, on all of the 2.4 gigahertz channels and on the lower and higher band uh, 5 gigahertz channels, we can just get on the channel, do a quick discovery, find out whether or not there's an AP, and it takes a few milliseconds. It's very, very quick. The problems really come in when we're dealing with roaming and we have to do passive discovery because on all those DFS channels, and a device cannot transmit on a DFS frequency it's dynamic frequency selection. It's because the uh, it's because the radar is basically the primary user of that, and so we have to give way to them. So we have to make we use the AP to make sure that nobody has radar on that channel. So our clients can't transmit until they hear an AP because the AP is responsible for that piece. The problem is now clients are having to listen to the channel for 105, 120 something, you know, maybe 150 milliseconds to see if there's any beacons, which is a really long time to be on some other channel looking for an AP. And so there's a there's some stuff we can do to help with that, but let's, I think we need to talk about some, maybe some six gigahertz stuff first. Cool, uh, we have a very good question, uh, ah. Scott. Do hidden SSIDs send out beacons? Absolutely. It's just the beacon is the the fee. If you if you were to go grab a packet capture and look at it, you would see it looks exactly the same as all of the other beacons. The only difference is the field that would normally contain the SSID will be null. It'll just be zero. There, there's nothing in that field. So it still advertises the beacon. It's just blank. The problem is, is when clients go to discover that, they can hear that there's something there, but they don't know what it is. So that's when the uh, they have to use an active discovery method to actually discover a hidden SSID because it doesn't get advertised. So the hidden SSID doesn't add anything to the security because when you're listening to the traffic, it's clear text. Any device yeah. connecting to the hidden SSID network will include the hidden SSID name in the association request. You can read that clear text, but hiding SSIDs might massively affect roaming, by the way, and it might affect the association. So when you hide it, be prepared that some of the devices will be very slow to roam, okay? Even, even if your network is otherwise configured correctly. Cool, so that was 2.4 and 5 gigs. Now let's quickly talk about six gigahertz. So guys, in 2.4 and 5 legacy bands, we had either a passive or active discovery method both of them in band okay so when you're looking for radios on 2.4 gigahertz band you will be probing or listening to beacons on 2.4 gigahertz band it changes a little bit on six gigs and something that we thought is not going to be as popular as it is is the out of band discovery method called the rnr rnr stands for the reduced neighbor report the first method on the list and rnr guys is very very powerful because in states you have 59 new 6 gigahertz channels. To put it into perspective, you have three non-overlapping channels on 2.4, three versus 59. On 5 gigahertz, you have around 25, depending on the region. Sometimes you have you know, 16, sometimes you have up to 28. Most vendors in most regions, they will have 25 channels available. So that's 25 versus 59. So if you wanted to use in-band discovery method and you were using 20 megahertz, 59, all of the channels in a massive environment, then scanning through all these channels would take absolutely forever. So since all the new radios, all the new APs, they have collocated legacy radios, like you know, in a six gigahertz enabled AP, you will have 2.4 and five gigahertz radios as well, right? Because typically you will have 2.4 on IoT, will be serving IoT. Now, five gigs will be guests, legacy corporate devices. Six gigs will be new corporate devices. And instead of scanning all these channels, RNR allows your Wi-Fi device to just ask three channels on 2.4, hello, three channels, one, six, and 11. 
do you guys have any collocated six gigahertz radios on your IPs? And then they will come back on 2.4 saying, yeah, sure. Yeah, I have like a, you know, six gigahertz radio on channel five. Why won't you ask about that guy? You know, why won't you, re why won't you connect there? So that's Arena. And now fun fact, Arena is the only discovery method that modern Apple devices support. So you have to use it. Even if you don't need 2.4 or 5, you absolutely have to have at least one SSID on either of these bands. This SSID can be a dummy SSID, different name to your corporate one, but it has to exist. Otherwise, your devices won't be able to discover six gigs. Okay, be mindful of that. Another one is multiple BSSID beacon frames. It's not really a discovery discovery mechanism, but it's more like the uh, optimization mechanism for reducing error time. Just a quick example. In legacy bands, if you have 16 SSIDs, and some crazy people in the world, they do have 16 SSIDs, okay, because they can, one for HR, one for finances, one for CEO, one for CTO, you know, so on and so forth. Every single SSID on every single channel on every single radio will be contributing to sending around 10 beacons per second, okay? And now on six gigs, we can take all the 16 SSIDs and include them in a single beacon. So that reduces the amount of network overhead without any client traffic. So that's quite strong, okay? And we will be using it quite massively. I won't be talking about fields and UPR. Uh, they are being, they're very similar to beacons. They are being sent every 20 milliseconds when compared to beacons being sent every 102.4 milliseconds. So five times more frequently than beacons. Even though they are smaller frames, they still contribute massively to the RTM utilization and we won't be using these things moving forward. Okay, we thought we would. Fields is still out there, but it's being used less and less by most big vendors. And now the last one, very important, preferred scanning channels. It's important in states only, pretty much, okay? If you have access to all 59 channels, then by default, you probably will go to 80 megahertz channels. And PSC, it scans every second, well, every fourth channel starting from the second channel. So it just will see 80 megahertz channels. If you have 40s or 20s in between, then it won't be able to scan that. It won't be able to discover that. So PSC, we actually thought that PSC will be the main method and it will force entire world to use 80 megahertz channels, but it didn't happen, okay? RNR is the thing and PSC is nice to have, okay? So if you need to have 20 or 40 megahertz channels in your environment in six gigs band, go for it. For as long as you have RNR, you're fine. In States, in Europe, doesn't matter. You're fine. RNR, the main one. Okay. Uh, I think it's enough about the discovery in six gigs. So let's move on to the second stage, which is association decision. So now we've discovered all the APs and Scott, that's your favorite slide, I think. So we know about all the APs. Now, what is the decision process about which one to connect to? Yeah. So in the same way that you might launch an app and you're, you know, I'm hungry for some pizza and I'm trying to decide which pizza place to go to. I might run an app and get a list of them. And as you can see in the, in the slide, you know, we've got the megahertz pizza. If I'm in the mood for a really spicy pizza, I might choose that regardless of all of the other pieces of information there. Uh, yeah, it's only two star. It's not the best pizza, but I really like spicy. Um, you know, if I'm a, Call it, you know, if I went back to college days, I'd probably go with Penny's Pizzeria every single time because it's cheap and it's got big portions. It might be a little bit slow, but that's not important to me because, I mean, back then I, I, I had less money than I had time. So it was okay, you know. So in the same way that we might look at a bunch of different variables to choose which of these pizza places do I want to order from today, our APs do the same kind of thing. They'll go through, or not our APs, rather our clients. Our clients will go through and they will find out about the APs in the area. And then based on a variety of different criteria, you know, things like signal strength, you know, what's the signal to noise ratio? What protocols does this AP support? Is it a wide channel? Is it a narrow channel? I mean, just about anything you can think of that would represent a characteristic of a wireless network is available for them to choose. So based on the different different clients will make different decisions. Um, and so our green diamond is kind of this idea. It's a, it's a diamond because a diamond is a decision point in a flow chart. And so in the same way that we make decisions based on a variety of variables, our clients make decisions based about a, a variety of variables. So it's, a, it's good to have an idea. I mean, you probably aren't going to get a lot of information about exactly how your LCMI, your least capable, most important device we talked about earlier, 
but you're not going to get a lot of information in all likelihood about how it makes its decision making process, but you can do some testing and you can get some ideas about how that device performs. And then you can take this green diamond idea uh, of how does the client choose to make its connections and you could leverage that to work on your design so that you can accommodate your LCMI. Yeah, and I'm not on gonna dog any of my pizza. Away. We have Italians in the chat and you mentioned pineapple on a pizza. They don't go down too well. <laughs> <laughs> pineapple okay. does not belong on a pizza. Yeah, maybe on Matt's pizza. Matt, Matt has joined the webinar, but on the wrong side. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so talking about the uh, Green Diamond and Association. Uh, so so now, you know, we have all the uh, all the channels discovered, all the radios discovered. We have made a decision using the Green Diamond algorithm. Every device will be making different decisions. The device has decided to join the access point B. And now the very quick process is to, after the discovery, uh, we will send the authentication request, open off. Uh, we will always have authentication response, always successful. That's from the old days. It stays there. Uh, and then we'll send association request and we'll have association response. So the association is like, you know, like a handshake, like, you know, hello, I'm a client. I want to join you. I can support this channel, this channel with this data rates. This is what I can do. And then the access point says, oh, I actually can do exactly the same things as you. So we have a match. We love each other. Let's connect. And then, you know, association in Wi-Fi is what link light, like, you know, the green lights, like bling, bling, bling is in wired world. So after association, even if you have like strong security enabled on your Wi-Fi network, you are connected to Wi-Fi and everything else is higher. Okay. Wi-Fi is there. Wi-Fi connection is there. <clears throat> Okie doke. So that's, that's the... A quick green diamond. Now, these are the elements on the left-hand side of the screen here. That client connecting to Wi-Fi network can take under consideration when making a decision about which BSSID, so which radio to connect to. Typically, it will be like, you know, the SSID name, obviously, right? I've connected previously to Ekahau 6, and now... It's on my list, so I'm looking for Echo House 6. Hidden, not hidden, whatever, Echo House 6, top of the list, SSID. But then I have 10 APs coming back to me. You know, I have went I went through multiple channels, and different responses will have different RSSI that will carry different density of a signal of a frame sent back to my device or a beacon. And now most of the devices will just say, okay, this is the strongest, this is like the closest to me, most likely, let me connect there. But it doesn't end there. When you have more flagship devices, more powerful devices like iPhones, for example, or flagship Androids, they will peek into beacons and or probe responses, and they will see how many clients are connected to that particular radio, what is the channel utilization on that particular radio. And sometimes, even if I'm standing close to the access point, very close to the AP, but it has very, very, very high channel utilization, my device might decide to actually connect to the access point 50 meters farther away that has half of the amount of these clients and half of the channel utilization, okay? So these are quite a lot of different things that can affect the green diamond decision. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, roaming and a little bit in more details about the association process. So uh, Scott, would you mind like putting a little bit more meat on the bones that I've just like introduced when it comes to associating to Wi-Fi? Sure. So in an ideal world, if we want to connect very quickly, the client will start by sending these probe requests. And so these probe requests are, again, we kind of mentioned it earlier, but we're going to send out a message to on the channels that we're connected to at the moment. And we're going to say, hey, what APs have, or you know, either what, eh, all APs on this channel, what SSIDs do you have? Or you might do a probe request that says the one SSID. Um, and so then any of the APs there are going to respond to that probe request. It's like, hey, yeah, I'm I'm an AP. I support 8 to 11 AX. I like long walks on the beach, you know, that sort of thing. And we're going to get all of that information about the details of the wireless network. Um, and then the client's going to look through all those details. It's like, well, okay, so, you know, maybe I'm an Apple device. We know Apple devices prefer the highest Wi-Fi standard that they support. So if you've got a Wi-Fi 6 phone, it's going to prefer a Wi-Fi 6 AP over a Wi-Fi 5 AP. 
They like wide channels. They like, you know, if there's an 80 megahertz wide channel, they'll connect to that. If the if the best thing available is a 40, they'll connect to that. If the signal's sufficiently strong, they will always prefer five gigahertz over 2.4 gigahertz. Um, and, and kind of understanding this is, is the key. So our clients are going through making those decisions. Once it has decided which AP it's going to connect to, then it sends that association request. It does that handshake where it basically says, hey, here's all the things that I support. The AP responds, hey, here's all the things we support. Um, and so then they get all connected. Now, the other thing that happens is if we're getting associated and perhaps we're on one of those DFS channels, and so we have to listen and do a passive discovery, it doesn't happen as quickly because you have to wait and listen until you hear a beacon. Once you hear the beacon, then the client will often send a probe. It's like, oh, yes, you have this channel, and then we'll go through and we'll go do our association process. And from that point, everything happens the same, except for the big difference there is if you can do the probe request to start with, it greatly reduces the time it takes to actually get connected. Um, I don't know, where else do you want, what else do you want? I mean, how much deeper do we want to go? <laughs> That's probably enough for, for this particular webinar. We might we might think about having something where we will have tons of time to dive deeper into things like that, but this will probably happen in, in the future. It's it's only max to the least. Okay, cool. So stay tuned uh, for next time. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine with me. Okay, so guys, let's quickly talk about a very quick example about what is normal in Wi-Fi. And what is normal in Wi-Fi before we start talking about anything else is that you will not always be connected to the best, closest access point from your device's perspective. It's not going to happen, okay? So look at that. We start in a big meeting room here, and we are connected to the AP3 on channel 48, okay? And now the client, the Echohow smartphone, walks out of the meeting room. It disappears kind of behind the metal, you know, cupboard units. And now it gets nervous to the point where the RSSI has dropped to a certain level, this level might be something different. So for example, for Apple mobile devices, this threshold where the device becomes nervous is around next 70 dBm. For uh, MacBooks, uh, which are not designed to be as mobile for laptops, it's around next 75 dBm, okay? When it becomes nervous and starts looking for, for the better alternative. By the way, sometimes I'm sitting here in my secondary studio and when my mobile router is downstairs or in a different room, it's a very old house and has very thick walls, I'm working comfortably with neg 80 dBm, okay, on my MacBook, and it works. Uh, my wife downstairs, sometimes she works on neg 85, and it still works. Just to give you an example of what is expected from Wi-Fi devices, okay? Cool. So now the device becomes nervous, and now it listens to beacons on DFS channels because it can't probe, so it will listen to this beacon. Uh, it will, you know, go off channel and maybe probe on channel 36. It will, you know, start discovering these different APs. And now it has discovered these two, for example, and now the device might make a decision, okay, I don't want to, I don't need to be scanning for any more APs, for any more channels, any more radios, BSSIDs, because I've discovered these two and both of them, they are good enough. So since this one, AP2, is closer to me, the RSSI is higher and maybe utilization is not super high, I want to connect to the AP2. And while this is all happening, the device, the, the user with this device moves down the office and it goes towards his desk or her desk, at which point the user sits just next to AP4, but the user has decided, the user device, to connect to AP2. And now this AP2 might be 20 meters away, and we are sitting two meters away from the best access point for us. And we won't even know about this AP because our connectivity is still good enough from AP2 the RSSI is still good enough from the AP2 that the device, until it reaches the threshold of next 70 or next 75 or whatever it is for your device, it won't even start scanning for a better alternative. So that's what's normal in Wi-Fi, okay? And I hope guys that it sheds some light on how roaming works, at least on a high level. Now let's spend a minute or five talking about how to test roaming so you have your brand new network you're super proud of it your devices connect and now you want to test your roaming i know tons of people that the first thing they do on wi-fi is they start a ping test or the throughput test you know the speed test and stuff and start walking around i don't think it's the best approach and instead of just like you know talking about what i think maybe we'll ask scott scott what do you think how you would test wi-fi 
Well, the problem with using things like throughput tests or ping tests is you're actually not really testing Wi-Fi. You're testing the layers above Wi-Fi. And so you might be testing Wi-Fi sort of along the way, but you don't really have any visibility into what's actually happening. Um, so one of the key things that I always tell people is like, hey, you know, anytime you're making any changes or you get a new device or you want to really understand the behavior of the tools that you have or the devices that you have, you really should have a lab. It's like, you do have a lab, don't you? Right. It's like, that's that meme where it's like, you labbed this up, didn't you? We got the princess asking Anakin. It's like, you did lab it, didn't you? Anyway, um, but you, you, you got to try it out see what actually happens it's the it's the only way to be sure so now i'm throwing in my references so but the um if you don't have a lab it's really hard to make any changes or adjustments or optimizations to your network without breaking something because eventually you're going to make something that you think is a very minor change and it's going to break everything when you're trying to do designs i mean a lot of times i will if i'm trying to design for a new device i will connect that device to one of the aps and then i will just walk away from the ap within you know in the survey mode or with like you know the uh, whatever kind of scanning tool that's available so i can see the signal strength that the device has and i will move away from an ap to see at what point the device decides to change to another AP or start going going to look so I can get an idea of what the requirements for the device are because it's really hard to design for something if you don't know the requirements. It's really hard to know whether or not things are working right if you don't know the requirements. And so we can also do some tests for like roaming behaviors because if you've got a couple of APs that are far enough apart, you know, it's like if you got them in a lab, turn the power to the lowest, you know, get get them, you know, five, 10 meters apart, and then you will should be able to get it to roam from one to the other. And you can kind of get an idea as to what it does. And then if you want to get really excitable, you grab out your sidekick and you do packet capture and you capture the roaming event so you can see exactly what's happening under, under the hood because a lot of our devices aren't going to be very forthcoming about that. But then we, you know, okay, so we did all this and we labbed it all up and then we actually deployed it in the office. How do we know if it's working? Well, now you know, we can do some real world, real world testing. Um, and so the kinds of things that I might do is in the old days, you know, when I was designing for like voice over Wi-Fi, I'd grab one of the phones and I'd walk around the building and basically we'd be going, do you hear me now? Yes, yes, I still hear you. Okay, do you still hear me? I'd walk around the building trying to see if I could hear any roaming events that were actually causing any problems. Nowadays, it's actually a little easier because it doesn't necessarily take two people because I can fire up a device and do, you know, uh, you use your favorite, um, uh, you know, uh, virtual meeting application, fire up like a YouTube video and share the screen or something. And then you walk around because that, that traffic coming from the meeting software is basically real time type traffic. If you have a hiccup, you're going to notice it. Now, if you just like try to run a YouTube video, that's just going to get buffered and it won't work. So you need something that where the traffic's real time. So if you're like sharing a video or something from uh, an app, from a meeting app and you walk around, then, you know, you're going to be, well, actually, you're probably not going to hold it up. You're going to be looking at it, but you'll walk around watching the device and you're going to be watching for video hiccups and for any kind of audio hiccups. And if you do see any issues, then you might have to dive in a little further. It's like, hey, you know, what, what happened there? Was that just an internet thing or did I actually have a roaming event that caused the problem? And so then you might have to dive in a little further, but most of the time you're going to be able to do that and get a really good idea of what's the quality of the roaming, because you're going to find it. You'll be able to duplicate that problem. If it's not an internet thing, it's going to just happen every time you roam and you're going to be going, Oh, or it might just happen when you roam to certain APs. So maybe if you're trying to roam to DFS APs, depending on your network configuration, that could be, a bit slower because of the whole discovery process. So those are some ideas that you can kind of uh, try and work for or try to look at, I should say. Yep, and that's a very good idea. So guys, just to quickly recap, if you've designed your network for voice or video, test your network with voice or video. And I've seen some comments about like pings and throughputs and stuff. Like think about it that way. What is the higher priority traffic, ICMP ping or a voice frame? Okay. So typically in a well-configured network, there is a higher statistical advantage of the voice frames than ICMP packets. So if you have hundreds of both, you will probably be able to send, you know, 98 voice frames and only two ping packets in the busy network will be allowed through. 
statistically, okay? So it's normal in perfect Wi-Fi that your voice works perfectly well, but when you walk around with the ICMP test, you know, then you will see like, you know, five milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, timeout, 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 and five milliseconds again, and it's normal, okay? It's expected. Conversely, when you're using throughput tests on Wi-Fi, what did we say before? That it's normal for your device not to be connected to the closest best AP, okay? It's normal. And what happens when your device is happy on a voice call or video call being connected to the access point 50 meters down the corridor, okay? What happens? Your throughput will start to struggle, okay? So your voice call is still fine, but your throughput, it, it's no longer like 200 megs per second or 1,000 megs per second. Maybe it's, you know, 25 megs per second. And it's still fine, but your throughput will be shown as red on your visualization. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't break anything. Wi-Fi works, okay? So yeah, another pro tip, don't try to fix unfixable things. I've spent like a few days in Barcelona one day in my career, like a few years ago, trying to fix MacBooks, Intel-based MacBooks, because the client was complaining that they are very slow to roam. And you know what? After two days, my conclusion was it's not possible to fix that. There was nothing wrong with the network. So the mobile phones, they were super, super fast to roam. I was running around the office on a mobile phone and it was fine and sleek on a video call. But the MacBooks, they were they were so slow to run. It's like they were like pretty much dropping off the network. So I was holding a laptop, screen open, walking around the office. And every time I roamed, I was dropping off from the call. And you know what? It's normal, okay? So new MacBooks, for example, on M1, M2 chips, they are designed to roam fast, but older ones on Intel uh, chipsets, they are not, okay? It's expected for your laptop to have it on the desk, close the lid, move to the meeting room, for example, and then open the lid again. And then your laptop will connect to the best AP, most likely, okay? Not always, but that's, that's what's expected. So don't try to fix something that is not unfixable. Okay, so let's go through a very quick uh, demo, guys. What do I have here? I have an office and I wanted to highlight a few things in that demo. First, a quick design for roaming, okay? And few things that you want to consider when you're placing your APs and few things that you might want to optimize when you have your existing network. So let's start with a quick design. I will select an AP that I have on my uh, last used list. This is Ekahow AI Pro, by the way. So this is our main software for validating networks, for designing networks, for whatever you want, for reporting. Quick design process, big meeting room, a developer's room, two meeting rooms, open space, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times six, like 40, 50 users around this area. Two APs would cover it nicely. Uh, I would probably use three APs to be on the safe side. And here, PlayStation 5 and stuff, fireplace, I'll place an access point there. So I'm fairly happy with, with, that, with that design from the coverage perspective, okay? This is a little bit underserved. Now, <coughs> excuse me, where do I place my AP here or outside? Now let's talk through that. I probably would place an AP here and I will tell you why in a second. So do you agree that it's a nice-ish design from the APs placements, AP density placement in this particular office? We have APs like placed every, I don't know, 13 meters, 14 meters, 12 meters, something like that. Do you like it? You don't like it? Why each AP on the same channel? Yeah, very good. Why don't you set next 65 dBm? Okay, so next 67 is like a golden-ish standard. When you design for next 67, in a predictive software, uh, you are taking under consideration free space, path loss, and attenuation, and sometimes diffraction and refractions uh, from the theoretical perspective. This theoretical perspective doesn't mean that your iPhone will have the same sensitivity as the free space path loss prediction. It will probably be a little bit lower, but next 67 is aggressive enough to cater for the slower sensitivity devices like mobile phones or barcode scanners. I'm designing my network edge to be NEC67, and at that edge, my iPhone will probably be at NEC72, and it's fine. My barcode scanner at the same point will probably be NEC75, and it's also fine, okay? So we are taking that under consideration with the NEC67 threshold. So that's the primary coverage. Now, answering your question about channels, you're absolutely right. We should calculate channels. So I will just use a quick channel calculator built into uh, Akahau AI Pro. Create <laughs> and it doesn't take too much time. And now we have perfect channels. So uh, we have agreed, I think, that oh, why would have APs in a straight line? Doesn't matter. It's like I can place this AP here. I can place this AP there. It really doesn't matter at all. I just placed it like that because it looks nicer for my pedantic eye. 
but it doesn't doesn't change anything. This plus minus one meter, it's whatever doesn't doesn't matter. Okay, uh, so the placement of the APs, I think, is fairly fairly all right. Now, let's take a look at the secondary signal strength, and let's talk about secondary signal strength. So we have we are now looking at secondary signal strength, and secondary signal strength is set also to next sixty seven dBm. So look what happens. I had primary in X67, secondary in X67. These are my success criteria for this particular project. And the reality is when you are connected to your best AP or close to best AP, you're moving farther away from it, you want to always be in a close-ish vicinity of the next best access point. You want to always have the alternative to run to. And if your secondary coverage is not same as the primary one, you are risking being in a situation when you get farther away from the AP you are connected to and that you don't have any better alternative. You will have to drop off from the network to then discover a good channel when you are getting closer to the radio and connect to it then when it's too late, when your voice call is, is over. So the best practice today for most environments is to have strong secondary coverage as well, mostly for roaming purposes. Even when you have warehouses, you will have tons of users with voice guided assistance with uh, you will you will have robots okay you will have robots that are picking stuff that are delivering stuff that are taking stuff off the shelves it's not unusual these days and the roaming is a key component of a fast performing network so secondary coverage is very very important now guys what do you think do i need to have secondary coverage in like the corner of this room do i care is it is it bad that i don't have a secondary coverage there do i really care about it what do you think? Put it in the chat. It's bad. I think it's all right. Jacob thinks it's all right. No, not bad. Okay. Why do you think it's not bad? Or why do you think it's bad? No issues, no roaming needed. Exactly, Ty. Well done. No roaming needed. So I'm not roaming in this meeting room. So I'm super happy not having secondary signal strength in this corner of that meeting room. It's fine. Okay. Another thing. Look, what would have happened if I had placed this access point in this room here and this access point in that room, in that room there? Uh, does it does it change anything? Did I break anything? Maybe I don't know. Let's put it like like that. Maybe so it, it's not too bad here. And let's take a look at the primary signal strength. Okay, let me play around with it a little bit so this bit disappear. Come on, little bit. Okay. I think we're getting there. So we have primary signal strength, failover. Uh, you could need a second signal if you need a load balance. Okay, I agree. But look what happens. Like if I place an access point, let's say in this room, I still have great signal strength, right? But now I don't think about roaming because look what happens. I'm connected. I go to this meeting room and I sit in this meeting room. Then I leave the meeting room and then I start going down, going down here. I'm hitting my roaming threshold around next 72 for iPhones. That's what I would expect to see here. At which point I have to discover my best APs from scratch, pretty much. I can't ask my existing connection about this access point. We will be talking about something that we call 802.11k neighbor list, okay, uh, in a second. But I won't be able to jump from this AP to this AP flawlessly, most likely okay i don't have something that we call the transition ap and conversely from here i don't hear this ap i won't be able to probably like walk there and and just seamlessly connect to that ap if i'm moving to the meeting room most likely i will just disappear behind the corner and then i will panic scan and then discover this access point so in order very quickly 802.11k neighboring list neighbor list is where i can ask my existing connection my existing ap hello mr existing ap I'm moving away from you and I want to run to something better for me from my device perspective. What are my best alternatives? What access points do you see around yourself? So now this access point will tell me about this guy and this guy, but it doesn't see this one. Okay. So I'm moving farther away. I'm going towards the meeting room, at which point my existing connection didn't help me. I had to drop off and then I discovered this one, perhaps, maybe not, maybe yes. So what I would do is for this reason, I would put this access point somewhere in a way where I don't have like, you know, very steep decline in a signal behind the corner. What I mean by that, look, if I place the access point here in the, here in like, you know, in the corridor-ish, I move down the corridor and then like a few steps away behind the corner, I will drop off, okay? So I don't want to have that. I want to have like a little bit lighter 
roaming event. So when I move the access point there, I don't have the steep decline. At this point, I will start my roaming event. I will start asking about better alternatives. I still don't see that access point there. So I probably would need to play around with it a little bit and place the access points like so they so they can so they can hear each other. So probably like that it will be considered the transition AP. So now these guys they probably will be able to decode their preambles. They will be able to know about their existence, okay, and include themselves in the uh, neighboring list. So we need to have sometimes for roaming something that we call transition APs. That means APs that are that can see each other, that can hear each other for 8.11k to work, okay. And that's pretty much that's pretty much everything that I wanted to to very quickly show you from the roaming perspective. And let's go back to slides. Where are my slides? Here. There we go. Slides. Okay. So we know quite a lot about roaming now. And now let's spend a minute or five talking about how we can improve that roaming. Okay. So, Scott, why won't you talk us through what we can do to make roaming faster, sleeker? More powerful. More powerful. Yes. Um, we can rebuild it. Wait, no. Anyway, the um, probably our biggest tool in our toolkit here is 802.11r. Because um, what 802.11r does is it allows you to avoid the entire authentication sequence. Um, so uh, <laughs> I made the mistake of reading the chat. and I'm getting distracted. Um, I got told I needed more power. I thought they were telling me to talk louder. Anyway, the um, uh, but with 802.11r, without 802.11r, every time we connect to a new AP, we have to go through the full authentication sequence, which means you know we get to have all that delay caused by the Radius server. And depending on where your Radius server is, that delay could be non-trivial. Um, I've had people who have had their Radius servers located in the US, but their actual location is in Australia, and it takes them like four or more seconds to actually get authenticated. If that's a roam, that's not going to be good at all. With AOTL11R, the first time you connect to the network, you have to go through the entire process, including the, the, the radius server. And it's really slow to get that initial connection, but nobody cares about that initial connection. That's OK. But once you start moving from one AP to the next, we encode the four-way handshake in the um, in our authentication and association process. And so uh, it, and we already are considered to be associated or not associated, but authenticated at that case. So we don't have to do the full 802.1x thing. So you can, it goes from like, however long it takes to authenticate. I mean, typically, you know, three, 400 milliseconds up to several seconds, depending on the radius delay to 30, 40 milliseconds. If you can do 802.11r, it's a huge improvement. And most modern devices that actually need to be able to roam do support 802.11r at this point. So R is the biggest thing because that makes that gives us our fast transition, our really quick roam from one AP to the next, and it makes it transparent to the user. I mean, even even if we've got voice frames queued and they're needing to get transmitted, voice frames typically need to be transmitted within about 150 milliseconds before users start to notice call quality problems. A fast transition roam is plenty fast to get that done, and the user will never even notice. Everything will be pristine. And so to speed that up, we can use 802.11k. That's probably our second most important thing to be able to use, because if we have 802.11k, remember, we have, especially when we're using all of those DFS channels, we have to cycle through all these channels, and we have to hunt around. And so we end up spending a lot of time trying to find an AP, and there probably isn't an AP on every channel. So how do we know which channel to go through? ADOS 11K, our client asks the AP we're currently connected to, hey, give me some candidates that I might be able to check. And then they'll get maybe three APs to choose from, and they can go scan just those three channels. And it goes way faster because they don't have to hunt around blindly. They've been given, they've been given a hint as to where to look. And so they'll go take a quick peek and then they'll get be able to get associated. Um, 802.11v is, I would worry too much about that. That the idea behind 802.11v is the infrastructure could and in, in suggest to our clients that maybe you should roam, but our clients don't have to listen, and most of them don't listen very well. Um, so, I mean, I usually our most of our clients are like you know unruly five year olds. They need guidance. So, <laughs> um, but 
eight to 11 K and R, I mean, they, they kind of do their own thing. So uh, I guess, so, the, so they're not like five-year-olds, but they're like teenage children, so, maybe. <laughs> okay. But always test that with the real clients is a key part of that slide because you're, if you, if your clients aren't working correctly with ADOS 11 R, or if it turns out that you have key devices that don't support ADOS 11 R, you may end up having to build additional SSIDs so that you can leverage ADOS 11 R. Um, or because if you just turn it on thinking it's not going to be a big deal, though, that's the day that you'll discover that something really important, probably sitting on the CEO's desk, is not going to connect to the Wi Fi anymore because you turned on ADOS 11 R. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Thank you, Scott. We'll come back to how to to, to where to uh, use these amendments uh, in our three steps. So now let's discuss quickly types of roaming, and especially when compared to 802.1x slash EAP. Okay. So guys, we've talked about the initial connection that it takes some time. It's slow. Okay. Users don't mind because it's the first connection. So you take your phone out of your pocket, you hit connect to that SSID, whatever. Then you have all the certificates magic happening in the background. You have the radius authentication in the background. You can have <clears throat> radius in a different continent. And for as long as it happens once, and it takes you know five seconds to connect, it's acceptable, okay? You go through the open system authentication association, then EAP authentication, then you have four ways handshake to derive the keys and encrypt your traffic and you're connected, okay? Until when you don't do anything else, then you have slow roam in your network. You don't have 802.11R enabled. You don't do anything else. It's just slow roam. So every time you roam, you have to go through the same stuff. The only difference is that the association frames, they are now called reassociation. So it's still slow. It's still full radius authentication, but now users complain, okay? They drop off from the networks and they are mad at you. So now when you have the dot one X, authentication in your network with radius server, it doesn't matter if it's overseas or in the same building, you always should have enabled 802.11R fast transition for your EAP based networks with the radius server, always, okay? Just for them. If you have like PSK or SAE, so password based WPA, uh, WPA3, WPA2, WPA3 uh, password based uh, security, you don't enable 802.11R, but for all .1x, you always do, or you should at least, okay? Now users are happy, it's fast, and radius authentication is skipped for subsequent reassociation roaming events. This is how we apply 802.11K, V, and R. So remember, step one, Wi-Fi discovery. To find APs faster, you use 802.11K. I actually quite like this slide now, okay? Uh, two, for association decision. If your devices support V and like using V and you've tested it in your lab that V makes good things to your network, enable it by all means. I typically tend not to enable it because in my experience, it was making more harm than good, especially with Apple devices where when infrastructure tells my, uh, tells my iPhone, Mr. iPhone, you're connected to me, but connect to my friend. By the way, if you don't connect to my friend, I will kick you off from the network. And then, you know, 100 milliseconds later, iPhone is gone. Then iPhone thinks, what the hell has happened? I want to connect back to you. And it connects back to the same AP. And then it's being kicked off from the same AP. Then it connects back. And when this happens three times, Apple devices will, uh, you know, block this entire SSID and won't connect back to it until you reset network settings. So be mindful of V being potentially helpful and potentially breaking things. So if you can decouple K, from V, probably disable V. Most vendors, however, you enable roaming optimizations and you have K and V being bundled up in the same package, one tick box, one, you know, whatever, drop down where you enable that both or disable both, okay? And then free reassociation that includes the radius authentication, always have 802.11R enabled just for .1x networks, nothing else. And most importantly, above all the optimizations, this is your physical design now, you want to have secondary coverage. If you don't have secondary coverage, then you don't have good roaming. Okay, and now guys, if you want to quickly check if you have secondary coverage, if it works fine, just walk around your site with your site gig, capture survey data, Upload it to the cloud, which is default anyway, and then ask optimizer how to increase 
improve your secondary coverage. Typically, if you don't have secondary coverage in modern, in modern networks, in modern offices, that means that your APs are broken, your switches are down, or you have crazy transmitting power levels. Some vendors, they do crazy things with transmitting power levels. When you don't tell the vendor to use like between 14 and 17 or to just use static in 14, sometimes you will have radios on 1 dBm, sometimes you will have radios on 30 dBm, and that also can break roaming. Actually, I think that was one of the questions from, from the audience. Uh, how does transmit power affect roaming? So transmit power can affect roaming quite massively. That means if you set your radio to 1 dBm, which is minimum transmitting power level, then the practical cell coverage from that particular radio is very, very tiny, okay? If it sits on 30 dBm, it becomes fairly big, and that will affect how your clients move around your network. Okay, so now, guys, let's take some questions. I appreciate that we are three minutes past, but we have some good questions from, from the audience. So, Dale, Stu, what do you have for Scott? Yeah, so one of the questions that was asked was um, how clients roam on DFS channels when the SSID is hidden. Can you kind of touch up on that? Difficultly. <laughs> uh, so what they would have to do is they have to listen until they hear a beacon. Once they hear a beacon, and if they don't hear the beacon for the thing they want, they can still send the probe request. It's just they have to wait to hear the beacon from an AP first. So that's just, that means, you know, you get 100 and some odd potential milliseconds. I mean, if you're lucky, it could be, you know, three milliseconds after you get on the channel, they might pick up a beacon from an AP. And it just has to be any AP. It doesn't have to be the AP they want to connect to. So as long as some AP is advertising beacons on the channel, now they know there's an AP on the channel and they could do a probe request, but they would have to do a probe request for the SSID. Got just it. slows it down. Yep, great answer. Um, another question that was asked that... Um was kind of upvoted is, can you set the threshold when to roam most effectively? Can you touch on that? <laughs> um, maybe, no. it depends. Uh, right. Some vendors, you can tune some of the 802.11v to related things, but as Max said, you know, that's, I, I'm, I'm not a fan. Um, the, uh, and it, but that really comes down to the drivers. Most of our mobile devices, there's not really any options for tuning in there. Uh, some of the Intel drivers will give you some options where you can adjust a number of the, uh, it will let you adjust a number of the settings inside the driver for like roaming aggressiveness is typically one of the things that people will play with. But there's some settings that you can do in there, but that pretty much limits your forced optimizations to Intel boxes or, you know, like uh, desktop PCs, I guess, not desktop PCs even, uh, like Windows boxes. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, the, none of the mobile platforms, uh, Mac, you know, um, I imagine it's probably possible to do the Linux boxes, but I don't know that any of us are using, you know, Linux boxes that we can manipulate the drivers for uh, as LCMIs. So, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, we have another one that is, I think, quite a good one. Does your power level uh does your power level comment mean you generally prefer to not use RRM? I think it, it's it's for me. So my power level comment about going for 14 to 17 or 14, not, not allowing the RRM uh, doing whatever it wants to be doing. So RRM, guys, it stands for in the Cisco world uh, for radio resource management. And that's basically a dynamic algorithm that sets transmitting power levels, channels, channel widths across your network based on the environment and whatever is happening in the environment. And I would say also, like, you know, some Clemens style, it depends, okay? Uh, but typically, what we tend to do in every environment, warehouse, office, whatever, at least we set transmitting power levels to static-ish values, like, you know, depending on the antennas that we use, typical internal omnidirectional 14 dBm is pretty much a golden standard because with typical 3 dBi gain antenna in the internal omnidirectional typical office grade AP, that will match the transmitting capabilities of most of the mobile devices. And that's what we want to have. If we start using maximum transmitting power levels, then all the devices, they hear the APs perfectly. But what happens when you have this tiny iPhone, you know, talking back to the access point, it's not going to be as loud. It doesn't have the capabilities, okay? So we want to match that. So yes, that will be probably static. 
And then I would take it one step further. Channel widths, always static, okay, always static. So if you have problems with CCI, set it to 20 megahertz. If you're on your own, you don't have neighbors and you don't have problems with CCI, smaller networks, set it to 40 megahertz. If you start to have CCI, so same channel overlapping problems, give it, set it back to 20. And now channel choice, my default or a good default, I think, would be to set it to dynamic. So allow your vendor to make channel choice decisions in most environments. The exceptions would be when you have a massive warehouse and you don't have too many neighbors in that particular warehouse, have a proper optimal channel plan, set it statically, disable RRM. In the office, however, where you have neighbors and neighbors have neighbors and they are doing different things with channels and it changes you know, every hour or every 10 minutes in a badly designed network, then you want to be able to react to the changes as well. Okay, so I hope that it answers this question. Okay, Chaps, do we have any more interesting questions there? Uh, we, you know, actually, it's still here. We do actually have kind of an interesting question that's come up quite a bit is how do we, on a survey, um, measure the roaming? You know, when we're out there serving with our sidekick and our uh, uh, survey app, how do we measure the roaming? And um, I think really what this is here, folks, is that um, the sidekick doesn't connect to anything, but the device that you're surveying on does. So you can actually watch that roaming effect as always you're transitioning between access points during a survey. It gives you a good indication of understanding when those roaming, roaming thresholds are met for that device. So if it's an iPad you're using, you're going to see what the iPad's experiencing or an iPhone or an Android device. So, or even doing it on a, a notebook. Um, so those are those are things that you can, uh, can measure. So the survey tool uh, with that, well, that cow can be very powerful in demonstrating that. Totally. Okay, Chaps, let's take two last questions. I will take the first one because it's simple. Mike asks, does 802.11R have any improvement when it's a PSK on an SSID? And the answer is no, it doesn't matter. You enable that. And if the device is supported, they won't use it. If they don't support it, they won't be able to connect. So don't enable it on PSK-based networks. It doesn't change anything. And the last question I think will be for you, Scott. Last question of the show. How important is validation with AP on a stick? before committing uh, the AP placement slash installation. I, I'm going to pull out my sla Sam Clements card and I'm going to say it depends because <laughs> um, <laughs> it, 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 it really it does. So if it, if the way I usually describe this is if when you install this, it has to be right the first time, there's no opportunity to make adjustments afterwards, AP on the stick is the only way to be sure. Um, the because you're measuring actual RF, you know exactly. You know you take an AP, you mount it, you do a temporary mount, uh, usually battery powered or something. You put it where you think the AP should, same height and everything, as close to where the AP will actually get placed as possible. And then you'll go around and do a survey, and you'll see where's that, where that signal goes. Then you know exactly where that AP will cover. There's no predictions involved. It's all measured data. It, and you install that AP, you're going to get those results. That's easy. If if it's if it's not a big deal to move an AP a little here and there, or whatnot, you know, um, if if it's like not a problem to do some adjustments afterwards, then you know how much of a deal it is just comes to your personal preference. But if it absolutely positively has to be right the first time, you can't come back and adjust it because maybe it's a really difficult place to install. You know, maybe, you know, if you're working in a hospital, if you have to like penetrate the ceiling in an ER, that's a really big deal. So now they're having to schedule the room to be closed. And then we're putting a hole in the ceiling and then we're mounting an AP. And then they have to actually go through and do a bunch of tests to recertify it afterwards. They're, they're not going to be happy with you at all if you have to. I can adjust that. So, you know, if you're doing anything like that, particularly complex environments, um, sometimes it's actually kind of nice to do in manufacturing, just depending on what the equipment is and the layout of the place. Um, but yeah, and anytime you're concerned about whether or not you could make adjustments or if it's a really difficult place to install, it's probably best to do AP on a stick first. Most of the time, it, it, it really is a personal preference, but those are the times that I would say it definitely is the best to do the AP on a stick. If you can't yeah, go and back and fix it, you have to, make sure it right. And typically you don't have to do AP on a stick for all the APs in your design. It's enough to do it like for a few. And if you can replicate the same results in your predictive design, then you know that your model works, okay? So yeah, Absolutely. no need to waste your time like that. 
Okay, guys, I, I appreciate it. it's 12 past. So thank you very much for your patience. And thank you very much for all of you staying a little bit longer with us. I hope you don't mind. We had quite a lot of great content, great questions. And we still have a little bit of questions unanswered. So if you want to have them answered, uh, please email matt.starling at ekahow.com. He will be able to answer all the questions for you. And thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, Ekahow team, Ekahow marketing team. And most importantly, thank you very much, Scott, for donating your time to be here with us today. And thank you for everyone attending the webinar, because if it wasn't for you guys attending it, there wouldn't be any webinar. So I appreciate all of you. Love you all. Thank you very much and see you in two weeks time.